Act is going to be through the th first part of 13. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days, and the Jews' Passover was at hand. <clears throat> Now in the Gospel of John, the ministry of Jesus is now underway. It was not inaugurated in the temple. That's not where it started. Or in the synagogue, and it wasn't inaugurated in a, during the meeting of the Sanhedrin. Not even in the streets of Jerusalem. The confirming voice of God from heaven spoke when he was baptized outside of any city by John the Baptist, his forerunner. And it was within the context of preaching and repentance. That was the circumstances under which he was made known. It might interest you to know that he still is made known under circumstances like that. Now, Jesus operated according to a heavenly agenda. You know, he didn't like ask, he didn't take the pulse of society and say, let's see what the people want to hear. He didn't do that. And he didn't ask the disciples or consult with them what they thought was the appropriate thing to stress. He already had an agenda. It was a divine agenda. And he'd come at an appointed time. And the very concept of an appointed time means it's God's agenda. It's wrong, wrong to, to preach at an appointed time according to human agendas. This is, this is a serious transgression. I know it's not considered so. But when people don't know the times, they don't understand the times, and they don't know what ought to be delivered, and they babble and blubber from the pulpit, this is serious stuff. This type of people are intruding in the divine agenda, trying to force their way in with their own uh, thoughts, and it's, it's serious business. When Jesus came, he cleared all that rubble away, see? John the Baptist did too. They cleared, they were not conventional. Neither one of them, they were not conventional. They didn't ask what people wanted to hear, and they didn't say, what are people having trouble with? That's what we'll minister with. This is a wrong assessment. Jesus isn't coming to straighten society out. If he, if he was, it had been straightened out. Now, the, the ministry of the Moses and the prophets was, was the same way. It was driven by a divine agenda. Times and seasons are always in God's control. You know, the disciples, they asked one time, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus didn't say, well, that's never going to happen. That's a misapprehension. He says, it's not for you to know. Yeah, yeah. This is none of your business. Mm -hmm. Times and seasons belong to God. Mm -hmm. They've already been set. Yeah. Times and seasons have already been set. Amen. God doesn't create times and seasons out of the requests of people. It's the people's business. Mm -hmm. It's their business to know the times. Yeah. And to know the seasons. What is God doing? It's our responsibility to know that. So how do, how do you come to know that? Well, you first of all have to want to know it. And you'll pick up on it. You will. You'll pick up on it. What can't, what's supposed to be picked up on? Jesus said to his disciples, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. See, when we're talking about things that aren't at hand now, Keep your nose out of that. That's what he's telling his disciples. Now Jesus uh, 
he rebuked the generation he preached to. He rebuked them for being able to know how the weather was going to be, but not discerning the signs of the times. He, he picked up on the lack of that. Jesus did. Oh, he's still the same Jesus. Here's what he said. When it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites. Isn't that interesting? He didn't say, oh, you stupid. He said, oh, you hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky but can you not discern the signs of the times? Now it's a sad state of affairs when people know more about weather than they do about God's dealings. That's a sad state of affairs. We are living in a moral free fall. Right smack in the middle of it. And I'm telling you, hardly anybody knows what's going on. The times dictate what is to be declared in the name of the Lord, in other words. So you just don't, like, get up and speak on something that's impressed you unless it's appropriate for the, for the times. That's involved in what the Scriptures call rightly dividing the word of truth. Now let's look at our text. After this, after this, after what? Well, after he turned the water into wine, after that event, mm -hmm. which was the beginning of miracles yeah, yeah. that he did in Canaan Can of Galilee, mm -hmm. manifesting his glory, and his disciples believed on him. See, if you're going to travel with Jesus, <laughs> you you got to believe on him. So the work of Jesus preceded the manifestation of Jesus. <laughs> People aren't going to see Jesus till Jesus does something. And Jesus can do a lot without people seeing it. In fact, at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, not many, not hardly anybody saw that. When Jesus is made known he will commence to work. This is how Jesus is now. When he's made known, he will commence to work. Now, Jesus, he was in some cities. I understand that there were some cities he worked, did most of his mighty works in. They didn't believe on him. Which revealed what kind of... And he didn't proclaim any great resounding truth to those on not on any regular basis. At any rate, he upbraided them for their hardness of heart. That Jesus could be present and nothing of significance be detected. See this? This is a bad situation. Generally speaking, in areas that are unresponsive, yet have experienced a dispensing of the Word of God, these are bad people. I mean, they may look good, you know, whether they be polite, yeah, yeah. good workers, good governors. But if the word of God is dispensed, mm -hmm. but the people don't receive it, mm -hmm. is because the soil is bad. Yeah, yeah. Either it's just a path that's so busy with other thoughts they don't have time to hear, yeah. mm -hmm. or it's thorns and thistles under the ground, there's too much, too many competing things that grow up, or there's their hard-heartedness. They just got a ledge of rock down there, and it, after they get over the initial rah-rah of hearing about Jesus, they can't go any further. But you got you to gotta really settle this in your own heart. Sometimes this will happen, you know, among people you know very, very well. Maybe your family or maybe relatives or what. There's a lot of God's being made known, but it's not getting through. Mm -hmm. It indicates a bad situation. 
Now, after he uh, worked this miracle, he went down to Capernaum. Now, eventually, Jesus did relocate in Capernaum, but it appears as though this was not the time he did that. It appears he appeared to have moved to Capernaum after he delivered that message in a synagogue of his hometown. It was after that uh, they let him out to brow the hill, going to push him over. He walked to them, and at that point he, he moved, he relocated in Capernaum. And that was some time after this that we're reading about here. In the meantime, he ministered in Galilee, which is the northern part, Judah's the southern part, to fulfill the word that was prophesied in Isaiah about the being in Galilee. And I gather that was after this event that we're reading about here. Now when Jesus was uh, in his hometown, Nazareth, he referred to a couple of Gentiles. He said there were a lot of widows in Israel, but God appeared to the widow of Zarephath, a Gentile widow. And there were a lot of lepers in Israel, but a Syrian leper. Well, see, these people were prejudiced, so this just made them irate. That's when they cast him out of the city. And then he goes, next verse says he goes to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, Jesus did a lot of things there, even though he upbraided that city. This is where he healed a centurion servant. That was in Capernaum. This is where he healed Peter's wife, his mother. That was in Capernaum. He healed a paralytic in Capernaum. He healed a man afflicted with an unclean spirit in Capernaum. He healed the son of a noble man in Capernaum. It was in Capernaum that he called a young child up and taught his disciples about being great to that child. And his remarkable discourse on the bread of life, John 6, that was in a synagogue in Capernaum. So he said and did a lot in Capernaum. But uh, they weren't responsive. He upbraided them. We know they were bad soil because of all this that had been done there that made no difference. See? Yeah. Yeah. See? That's how you know you got bad soil. You can't look at it and just diagnose it externally. This is, <laughs> it's when you deliver the things of God yes. and they don't, they're not received, they don't take root and the people don't accept it, no matter what anybody else says, bad soil. Yeah, right. Amen. Jesus upbraided Capernaum, Bethsaida, mm -hmm. and, uh, Third city, you lose me right now. Three cities he upbraided for their unbelief. Now the scripture says he, Jesus, Jesus went to Capernaum. He's the one that is where he was going, the rest of them went. Mm -hmm. He, his mother, mm -hmm. his brothers, and his disciples. Some feel that are of the Catholic bent that his brethren were near kinsmen. They weren't brothers, they were like cousins or something like this. The sons of Cleopas, some, one, some say. Jesus' brothers, however, are named in Scripture, and they were his brothers. James, Joseph, which is a, the Greek form of Joseph, Simon, and Judas. So they went, his mother went with him, and his brothers went with him. And his disciples went with him. At that point, it was Andrew and John, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. Mm -hmm. So this little cluster of people all went yes. together to Capernaum. They're divided by gender, right? Mm -hmm. They're divided by age. They're divided by occupation. <laughs> And they're divided by understanding, but they all travel to, yeah. Yeah. all travel together. 
They lived out what the 55th Psalm says in verse 14. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. See? Conglomeration of different gender, different age, different occupation, different, you know, different perceptions, all travel together. Now every exposure you're given to Christ, and this is every exposure you're given to Christ in Scripture, he was always doing the Father's business. Yes, amen. Amen. You would never read anything Jesus did that was mundane. Yeah, right. yeah. mm -hmm. did, well, didn't he do anything mundane? Well, that's not even a point. It's a dumb question to even ask. Yeah, right. Of course he did. He was in the world. <laughs> but he didn't even receive honorable mention. See, some well-known religious people, some well-known Christian people are known for what they do in society in general. That's what they're noted for. But it's just not what Jesus, this is not what Jesus was noted for. He was never depicted as being engaged in trivial pursuits. Not there. You just, re just read through the Gospels and you'll see that this is the case. This is how God wants him to be known. God does not want Jesus to be known as the patcher up of human troubles. I know that destroys a lot of people's living. I understand that, but that, it needs to be destroyed. He's never represented by God as a carpenter, even though he was. Uh -huh. <laughs> God never said, now listen, my son's a carpenter. And the disciples didn't say, Jesus the carpenter. They said, Jesus of Nazareth. They never, mentioned, they never mentioned him being a carpenter. It's the people that didn't know him that, that called him a carpenter. They're making a point here. That the, the Spirit is consistent in, his, in the presentation of Jesus Christ. He's consistent in how Jesus lived and what he did and where he went and what he said and the people he kept with him, the people he taught. It's consistent in, in uh, his representation of it. We don't have any lecture about Jesus on marriage. Mm -hmm. That's right. Or what's the appropriate work, employment. Mm -hmm. Or what kind of government is best. Or you don't have any. Yeah. He didn't spend time on that kind of thing and that kind of pursuit. Yeah. You say, are you saying it's wrong to do that? I'm saying, well, I'm saying almost is. He's not even bent in that direction. See, in every way, Jesus was and remains separate from sinners. Amen. He was a member of the human race. He'd be not made like us, but he was separate from sinners. And the record makes that clear by the way it presents it. He always, without exception, is presented as the righteous one. He testified of his devotion to God. He told publicly, pull it. He said, I do always those things that please him. Yeah. Say, what pleases God? Well, if you don't know what pleases God, then that's, that's your first assignment. Yeah. Amen. Find out what pleases God and do it. Yeah. Amen. See, that's, that's it. That's right. I'm telling you that most people aren't, now they're not this serious about, they're not this serious about spiritual life. But you've got a mandate from God to know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is God pleased with? What does God expect me to do? Once you know it, do it. Jesus did. See, that was, that's what distinguished him. He said, my meat, this is the thing that really sustains me, keeps me going. My meat to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's the thing that nourishes me. He said that when his disciples tried to get him to eat. Yeah. Remember, he'd been, they were real hungry, and they went into the city to get some food, come back, found Jesus sitting on a well talking to a woman, tried to give him some to eat, and he refused. He said, I got meat to eat you don't know about. Right. Yeah. Now, if you've walked any time with Christ, you already know what I'm going to say. You already know it's true. If you don't, just listen up, because this is the truth. Some time spent with God will do more for you than a good meal. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. It'll put his 
My father used to say the spizzerinctum, it'll put it into you. Amen. It's the truth. It is. It'll fire you up. They say, well, you got to eat sometime. Well, Jesus did too, but that's not, the, that's not the point. The point is the real impetus of life is found in concourse with God and with Christ. Jesus, Jesus lived that out. Now, remember, his, his mother and brothers and disciples went with him. He didn't go with them. They went with him. And they continued there in the Capernaum. Not many days. They didn't spend many days there. Stayed a few short days, remained a few days. Some versions say they were there two or three days. Just short stay there. This means there was a higher purpose. When they left Cana, there was a bigger purpose than going to Capernaum. Okay? Something bigger. So they, just, they didn't stay long there. Probably just to rest up for a while. Now, I know that uh, Jesus eventually, he did go to Capernaum, but that's not why he went there this time. This was just a stopover place. Now, the people have got something to note here. There are places and activities in which lengthy periods of time should not be spent. Capernaum was such a place. It wasn't good to spend a lot of time there. If you haven't learned this, well, I charge you to learn this. There's some places you just can't spend a lot of time there. Unne well, unnecessarily, we're talking about. Unnecessarily. I mean, you have to, may have to do like Paul spent two years in prison, but that wasn't like the... He didn't request us, and I got. I wrote so many epistles when I was in prison. I'd like to permanently be a prisoner because I get more writing done then. See, <laughs> this, this wasn't the place to stay. That's right, yeah. There's some places you may have to be in for may have to be in for a while. You don't have any choice in the matter. But then there's this come not many days, you know, and you got to be able to recognize it's not make time to get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Time to leave. God's placed members in the body of Christ where it has pleased him. Amen. Right? Yeah. That's first Corinthians twelve eighteen. That's just that's a revelation. Now your your total life should revolve around that placement. Amen. Yes. You see, in other words, you, there's no part of your life that you can divorce yes. from that placement. Amen. If you don't know what it is, that's your assignment too. Find out what it is earlier about all the works that he had done here in Capernaum, yeah. you know, there, we, to, 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 in my own thinking, we, we have received a lot. Jesus has worked a lot among us. I know. And this, um, this preference that they had to be with him, see, this is wrong. It, even though there were many different kinds of people that went with him, it's wrong for us to judge ourselves by ourselves by looking at see we've all been given perhaps other things to do in the body so we're not identical but see we can all go with jesus we That's can right. all benefit from the things that he says yeah. take them and, yeah. and use them in this function you just mentioned this thing that we we've, whatever christ has given you to do you can hone that skill as it were to where as you give yourself to the lord He'll be able to use the very thing that he gave you. Yeah, Do you remember the talents? He the, he multiplied it. The person that used it yeah. did. Amen. So this thing that you just talked about, he's he's um Christ knows what, who's with him. He, he's not yeah. he's not ignorant of that. He knows and he ministers accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing else you'll notice in the, in the gospels as we go through all this that whoever joined himself to the Lord stayed with him. Yes. Now here you got these disciples. They joined. They, they were with them, or they stayed with them. Yes. Same thing with the twelve. They they stayed with them. Whoever they didn't like visit them mm -hmm. once a week or whatever. Yes. They stayed with them wherever he went. And he had this entourage going with him all the time. These disciples. And some remember there were some women that followed him. Some of them were women of means mm -hmm. that helped them right. with their living. Mentioned that because 
you know, it, you could, I think, I myself, I know, it can grow, grow to a point to where you say, well, look, look at what, we, we got all this great knowledge, all, but see, to whom much is given, much, much is, is required. required. That's right. So see, what we, and I'm not saying anybody here does it, I, I know that there is a tendency to think, to, to, to not, to think that you're above this kind of standard, but see, if you are being blessed, if you are rejoicing yeah. in Christ, then it's for a reason. He hasn't given you these things yeah. just so you can sit around and talk about them, as it were. It's so that you can put it to practice. Amen. You can actually do the will of Amen. God. Amen. That's what I meant. Where he placed you in the yes. body, uh -huh. your life revolves Amen. around that That's placement. Right. Everything Paul did had something to do with being an apostle. Yes. Same was with Peter. Yes. Same was with the early deacons. Whatever they did had something to do with where they were placed. Amen. If you're an exhorter, everything with something has something to do with that. Yes. Why? Because this this is your fundamental purpose in life is fulfilling what God has put you here to do. Amen. That's your primary <coughs> vocation. As one is being directed to the Lord, things will be worked out for their ultimate good. Romans 8, 28 says that them that love the Lord. See, but it presumes the one who loves the Lord will be directed by the Lord. So the one who loves the Lord and whom the Lord is working with, everything will work out for their ultimate good. Now, there'll be things happen independently, like being stoned, being in prison, being shipwrecked, being bit by a snake, you know. There's things that they're independent experiences but they'll work together for good why because you love God Amen. and because he's directing your life God this God doesn't do this for everybody everybody's life things don't work out for good don't say that to unbelievers because this is not true everything's against an unbeliever nothing's working for their good Till you're connected with Christ, nothing's working for your good. Experientially. Mm -hmm. On one occasion, Jesus said to Pilate, For this cause came I into the world. Now, if you just stopped right there and asked people, what, what was it? Well, you'd get a variety of answers. Here's what he said. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. How's that for a purpose? Hmm. Huh? Now, Jesus came to die. We understand that this is absolutely the truth. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's something people aren't so familiar with. I came to bear witness to the... Do you let Jesus talk to you? Do you listen to him if you've heard him? And been taught by him the truth as it is in Christ Jesus? Jesus said, I came to bear witness to the truth. So you've got to have an ear to hear what he's saying. Amen. And pay attention to it. Yes. Because you're, make, you're making the point that Jesus was always about his father's business. The, it was his meat to eat that his disciples didn't know. He came and perfectly suffered. I've been reading C.S. Lewis and in one of his books, he makes the point that Jesus came to suffer because he was a human, but he did it perfectly because he was God. And that the life by which he did that has been given to us. And so now his meat was to, was to do the will of God. We have that life in us. So that's what we, we must do as well. Our answer must never be that we're doing something other than the will of God. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would, um, if that's what C.S. Lewis said, he suffered because he was human, but he overcome because he was God. Is that what he said? He, he said he suffered because he was human and did it perfectly because he was God. That I disagree with. <laughs> Could you say something more about it so I can get a handle on it? Mm -hmm. He overcame as a man, not as God. He had to believe God. He had to trust God. No, he didn't. That's what he left behind. 
That's what he left behind, was the prerogatives of deity. To be able to do something as God, that's what he left behind. That's what he forsook. He did this as a man. The man Christ, not a mere man, but a man who had the spirit without measure. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's something to think about, but see there, I'm afraid this is taught by a lot of people. And this neutralizes the fact that Jesus overcame. Jesus overcame the same way you overcome. Except he did it consistently. He had the resources that we receive in him. Those are the resources he overcame. Amen. In Amen. thee have I put my trust. That's what it says in Hebrew. In thee have I put my trust. That's a more punch to the argument then because Jesus right. did it when he wasn't God. That's right. And the life that he had apart from God has now been given to us. That's exactly In, in great light. See, that puts it in our reach. You can see this. It, that puts it within our reach. Someone going to say something? Okay. Now, the thing to draw from this is that Jesus was driven by divine purpose. That's the thing that drove him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. I, I, I've, I've got to do what God has sent me to do while it's day, because the night comes when no man... In other words, when God gives something to be done... There's a time frame within which it's to be done. Mm -hmm. Jesus knew that. He said, I, I must, I've got to work it while it's day. While it's day, I must work the works of him that sent me. Remember one time, and, man, he had to pick up on every opportunity. He had to pick up. They're walking into the city. <clears throat> There's a man born blind there. His disciple says, why is this man blind? Was it because he sinned or because his parents sinned? Jesus didn't say, that's bad reason. You know, that never happens. See, because there were some people and that is why they were there. He said, no, he said, he sees now, this is the work. He says, this man was born blind that the works of God could be made manifest in him. God's put him here for me to work a work. He, he picked up on it. See, he was alert. He picked up on that occasion. For this cause, he came into the world. See, alertness is required. I know you. I know you know this, but we we must we must pick, we must hone up our knowledge of this. To be alert, you can get sidetracked, in particular in this world we're living in. You can get sidetracked. So you're paying attention to like. What's the difference if the thing doesn't work out like you want it at all? It doesn't change anything, really. And you can get drawn aside to the mundane and get all tied up in trivia like you're tied up in ropes. And pretty soon you're all up in ropes tied up. You can't do a blooming thing because you set your hand to do so many different things that aren't really that important. See? Some people do it for their kids. Some people do it for money. So there's a different reasons why people do it. Jesus, did, he refused to be caught up in anything but God's will. Yeah. <laughs> and that's broad enough that, and practical enough. You will not be an impractical, lazy slouch. I mean, right. don't, this, this will not result in that. Uh -huh. Now, alertness is required. Jesus said... Someone going to say something? Uh, what, what Jesus said there ties everything that he did, ties it all together. That's right. Mm -hmm. and with, without knowing that, just to like take a, a, a casual glance at, at everything that he did, it can actually look random. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because he would, you know, he'd travel over a sea and then he healed the one man. <laughs> And then he'd go back. Mm -hmm. But then another time, at, at, it was at Peter's house. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. Yeah. And then everybody they brought to him, he healed them all. Yeah. Pool, pool of Siloam, he healed one man. One man. But it was full of impotent people. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you try to tie those things together and see and try to find, like, the pattern of his, you know, yeah. his planning. Yeah. And his long-term goals and short-term goals. 
It's like there isn't a pattern. Yeah, that's right. And but this is this is what ties them all together is that he was bearing witness to the truth mm-hmm. and he's doing the work of his father. And it went, the work of the father yielded fruit. Take that gathering demoniac, Gadara. It's the only time we have record he went to that place. But the next time, not the only time, but the next time he went there, there were a lot of believers there. So they, so that demoniac, that had to be that demoniac. Nobody else accepted Jesus. That had to be that demoniac. But God was in it, see? The Syrophoenician woman. She was sent back. Jesus wasn't common in that territory. You can, you can, this, this woman will say something about him yes. after Jesus healed his, her daughter. Yes. Alertness is required. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I kind of have a burden for this because I see how, much, how many distractions there are. I mean, if we were living out on a farm someplace, you know, you got up and you worked and you, then you come home and you ate and you went to bed and so forth. But there's a lot of distractions. But here's what Jesus said. <clears throat> I'm sure emphasizing his alertness. You know, he went to Capernaum and he didn't stay there long because he was driven by another agenda. That's what I'm commenting on. Yeah. I say unto you, the son could do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. But Jesus had to be where the showing was being done. Can you see that? He, he gonna, I'm driven by the divine agenda. Now, God tells me what he's doing, but he had to be alert to see it. Jesus conducted his life so he was never enveloped with distraction. If if he was threatened to do that, he'd like, leave. He didn't allow himself to be enveloped with distraction. The landscape of life was kept clear. See, so he could see what the Father was doing. Now, you can't codify this. I understand this. This, this has got to be worked out between you and the Lord. But this sensitivity has to be developed. If you don't, you'll just walk around confused all your life and not sure and blundering, and that'll be what your life is like. The Father never had to say anything two times to Jesus. Mm-hmm. You don't read Jesus, God talking to Jesus saying, and again I say. See, Jesus said that to men. God didn't say it, speak to them because he was alert. He was alert. Another thing that's seen here, he, he went to Capernaum, stayed a little while, then moved on. He was driven by compulsion, inner compulsion. Sometime one time, People, some people told him to watch out for Herod, who was a king, you know, he was a king. He said, uh, go ye and tell that fox, sneaky old Herod, tell that fox, behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow. Tell him that, that today and tomorrow I'll be in this area doing cures, casting out demons. Tell him that. And the third day shall I be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. (laughs) Compelled. That's compulsion, see. Driven. Not by an order. It was inside. His perception of God, his perception of the will of God, knowing what God sent him to do, it, it drove him. Yeah. Amen. Now, some, something drives you. Mm-hmm. Yes. Whoever you are, some, something drives yes. you yes. or compels you. Mm-hmm. I suggest that you let it be the will of God. Amen. He was driven from within by his love for the Father and his understanding of what the Father was doing. Understand his mission. 
The pleasures of men didn't shape his life. Mm -hmm. the, tr the trends that were happening didn't alter how he thought. Mm -hmm. Car captures attention. We know that Jesus later said of Capernaum that it, there was certain obtuseness existed there. In fact, he told him, he said, if the works had been done in you, had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. How about that? Now, in his last phrase, we find out why he left Canaan, stopped at Capernaum, and moved on because the Jews Passover was at hand mm -hmm. and Jesus he he was headed for Jerusalem yeah. see his life and his work wasn't driven by a Gentile agenda mm -hmm. I suppose some people would argue with Jesus about what well, the Passover is not going to last you know I know it was in it was in force at the time That's right. and Jesus is going to magnify the law and make it honorable he has to Jerusalem. Now Capernaum was about 16 miles from Cana, and it was like a stopover point for travelers headed for Jerusalem. He probably rested there for a while because Jerusalem, as I understand it, was about 85 miles from Capernaum. So it's a pretty hefty journey by foot. See, what does that teach you? Well. It teaches me how demanding the work of the Lord is. It demands heart, soul, mind, strength. All of the heart, all of the mind, all of the soul, all of the strength, see? Or spirit, soul, and body, if you want to summarize it another way. To the believers in Christ, it's that same thing is stated this way. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And spiritual growth is to be, quote, in all things mm -hmm. up into Christ. Yeah, in all things. Mm -hmm. If we wonder what living in this manner entails or what it involves, we have the life of Christ for an example. Mm -hmm. We have his life for an example. In fact, he said this, I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. What did I give you? He gave them what God gave him mm -hmm. to give to them. I've, he's an example. See, of what it means to live for God, Jesus is an example mm -hmm. of what that is. Walk in love as Christ also, see here's an example, as Christ also loved us and has given himself for us and offering his sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. See, he's an ex that's why it's important to pick up on the texts like these. Because he's giving you an example how to live. You live driven by God's will. Again, even here in two were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And why did Jesus suffer? Because he was doing the will of God. That's the only reason he suffered. Why should you suffer? Because you're doing the will of God. If you suffer for any other reason, you got it coming. That's really the way it is now. Let no man suffer as an evildoer or as busybody in other men's affairs. Don't let anyone suffer because of that. See, we read that we, we don't belong to ourselves. We've been bought with a price. Amen. We're not our own. That's why we live for Christ. Now this, I know you know this, but I, I still feel compelled to say it. This is not just like something you know like, you, like a school book. I mean, it's... This has got to be done. Yeah. Living has to be done for Christ, and only you can do it. Nobody can do it for you. That's right. The best we can do for each other is tell each other what is required, exhort each other to do, to do it, be faithful, just admonish one another. That's, that's the best we can do. But this is our assemblies have to have exude this kind of pressure on the saints. Yes. 
who have no heart for this will not be attracted to it. That's right. Like that. That's right. And God, and that's, God a, that's a safeguard in a sense. And God won't receive it anyway. He doesn't yeah. receive people like that. Amen. <laughs> I came down from heaven, he said. I came down from heaven. Pretty big cost associated with coming down from heaven. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Okay. Now the time, he's going to Jerusalem because it's the time of Passover is coming. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He went up, up to Jerusalem. Directionally, Jerusalem south of Cana. Mm -hmm. It's south of Capernaum. Uh -huh. But he went up right. to Jerusalem. It's the elevation of Jerusalem, not the direction of Jerusalem. Okay? No matter where you are, directionally, you always went up yeah, that's right. to Jerusalem. That phrase is mentioned 25 times in Scripture. Up to Jerusalem. Gath was on the west, but from Gath they went up to Jerusalem. Syria was on the northeast, but the scriptures say they went up to Jerusalem. Joppa was on the west, but they went from Joppa up to Jerusalem. Nazareth was north, but they went up to Jerusalem. Bethany was in the east, they went up See, wherever you went, wherever you were, you went up yeah. to Jerusalem. Amen. And wherever you went from Jerusalem, you went down yeah. from Jerusalem. You went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, but Jericho was northwest. Mm -hmm. Went down to Gaza yeah. from Jerusalem, but Gaza was west. You went down from Jerusalem to Caesarea, but it, Caesarea was north. Hmm. See, and ge geographically, the land of Canaan, you got your bearings in Jerusalem. That's, <laughs> that's where you got your, got your bearings. This is where you obtain a proper perspective and develop the right priorities. Mm -hmm. Even the geography of the land of Canaan depicted spiritual realities. Yes, see? Amen. We go up yes. into the heavenly realms. We go up, mm -hmm. and whenever we go anyplace else, we go down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, remember that. See, when you go down from the heavenly, it says, but this is not good. Mm -hmm. If it's necessary, you just linger as long as it's just a few days, like in Capernaum, right. just a few days, yeah. and get, get out of there. Mount Zion. Now see that Jerusalem was the high, was located in the highest part of the land, and the temple was on the highest hill in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So it's like the highest high. Yeah. <laughs> great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain. Mm -hmm. Talk about Jerusalem in the mountain mm -hmm. of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount. Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in all of her palaces, the refuge. Mount, see, it's the high. Mm -hmm. So the geography of Canaan depicts spiritual life. Yeah, you always go up mm -hmm. to be in the spirit. You go up yeah. mm -hmm. to fellowship with Christ. You go up. Mm -hmm. That's out of this other. Amen. You leave the flesh and you... That's right. In your heart, in your mind, you leave that, go up. And if you're ever in the process of going uh, down, you, you, you don't stay there long. There are, you've got some friend, you personally have some friends and relatives mm -hmm. that will pressure you to come down. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We've all got them. Right? Yeah. We've all got them. Pressure you to come down. Come on down off the wall. Let's have a talk down here. And Nehemiah said, we're not coming off the wall. Yeah. We're not coming down into the plains of, oh, no. So the Holy Spirit reminds us that we've come to Mount Zion. 
to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We've talked it's a mount, it's a high. The atmosphere is rarefied up here. The contamination's not not up here. Refreshments up here. Visions up here. Fellowships up here. Come up. Remember, the angel said to John, "Come up." Come up here. Uh-huh. The angel didn't say to John, hold on, I'll come down there. Uh, huh? He said, come up. Mm-hmm. That's what God's saying to us. Yeah. Even if you're in Capernaum, you got to come up. Let's get up to Jerusalem. We've got business here and there. We've got to stop over here and there. We understand, but, that's, but our journey's not complete till we mm-hmm. get there. Every other location, mm-hmm. you've got to descend to get to it, yeah. and to get to the heavenly realm, you have to ascend from yeah. it. Every other, yeah. every other location. Yeah. The activities that relate to this spiritual condition, spiritual location, are like the Passover. That was what we'll cover this the next time. But the Passover was about to happen. Mm-hmm. That was something God has spoken of. The Jews didn't have. Uh, an option not to observe the Passover. They had to observe the Passover. And Jesus magnifying the law and making it honorable. He didn't say it, stay in Canaan after that miracle. Some men would have said, well, boy, you could establish a base here and we can really get off to a big kickstart here. Yeah. Huh? Right here in Canaan. This miracle happened. Think what? Think what? No, we got to keep the feast. Right. Got to keep the feast. Because I'm leaving an example for the people who are going to follow. That even there's a lot of good stuff to be done, God's stuff's got to be done. Amen. See? So they went up to Jerusalem, and that's where you get the advantages, brother. When you're willing, every person has to work this out for themselves. Every advantage you realize from heaven will involve effort on your part to get away from certain things and to certain things. Yes, amen. It will not like drop down. Things drop out of heaven and hit people like hailstones, but it wasn't a blessing. When hailstones fell out of heaven, it didn't bless anybody. Yes. Anyway, you can uh, wear it. That'll prepare us for the next yes. amen. next. What is it? It was all yeah, it looks like everything was just incidental, but it wasn't. It was very much on purpose. And he just leaks out a little information of what was going on in Jerusalem moved Christ to be there. Amen. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Brother Ricky. There are a number of significant things related to God that took place on a mountain. <laughs> I think of when Abraham offered his son, yeah. it was on a mountain. mountain. Uh, the giving of the law took place on a mountain. mountain. One of the battles that drew or the Israelites won, they won because Moses was up on a mountain holding yeah. his hands up. Uh, the death of Christ was on a mountain. The transfiguration was on a mountain. Before Jesus picked his disciples, he went up into mountain. a mountain and prayed. Mountain. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. heard about John the Baptist. He went up into a mountain and mountain. prayed. Yeah. Amen. So we learn from this that Amen. Uh, significant things related to God take place when you're in high places. High places. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yes, amen. It's all lived out. It's wonderful. It's all lived out. Yeah. And it's lived out per- in Christ, it's lived out perfectly. Yeah. See, it's perfectly lived yeah. out. with Christ in heavenly places. You know, that, that there's a certain amount of, of labor to get there, but when you get there, there's rest. Yeah. You're seated with Him. Yeah, you know, they, 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 he can, He'll establish your, your, your faith in, at, if you're with Him in these heavenly places. There's a lot less distractions, yeah. and, and, um, but it does take some effort to get there. Yes. You've got to have these wings of an eagle. Yeah, fly away. Yeah. Amen. That's why we can walk through the valley. That's right. The yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, valley is between two mountains. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sarah? I like the point that you said uh, Jesus is a good example 
of uh, living for Christ, and I was thinking he was a man like we are, and he lived for Christ, so that means that we can too. That's right. Amen. He lived for us so we can live for him. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Sister Sydney. Um, on this subject, you, you can, um, the Lord can reach you when you're in different places. Like the Lord can reach you when you're in low, low places, yes. but that's not always in your best state. You, um, you're, um, I'm trying to word this correctly. You, he can reach you when you're in low states, yeah. but that's not exactly where you prefer to be. With um, that's right. Mm -hmm. be. You prefer to be in higher places because that's where you get the best benefit. Yeah. Yeah. See, Amen. Am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are some low places. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Lifted me up out of a horrible pit. Yeah. When you read about Jesus and the things that he did, you notice it doesn't it doesn't comment. John doesn't say, and this is what all of us should do. That's yeah. right. That's right. He kind of just, this is what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Because this this can't be legislated. That's right. right. Uh -huh. Jesus didn't come to, to like, give us another law. Mm -hmm. but, but he did live out the law. That's right. He's like the perfect Israelite. That's right. Jesus uh -huh. was like, or the, he, he, he was the perfect, he's what Adam should have been. That's right. Mm -hmm. In the flesh. But he, of course, he was the son of God. Yeah. And so, like we were saying before, he's showing us this. This is what the new man does. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. He he came to make, Jesus came to make us like him. Uh -huh. Not not by just commanding us to yeah. do certain things. Amen. Mm -hmm. But but this is this is a this is a picture of the new man. When Jesus kept the Passover, <coughs> he really kept. The Passover. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Whenever Jesus did, he did it for the right reason. That's right. Mm -hmm. so you could keep the Passover and not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. That's you, right. You could like right. go through the motions. Yeah. yeah. But that's not what Jesus did. Every everything Jesus did, mm -hmm. he did it unto God. He did he didn't just go through the routine. Mm -hmm. He didn't do it for other people. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now you notice there's, a, there's another thing that in that very thing you're talking about that the difference between law and grace. Jesus lived it out. So instead of saying, this is what you have to do, you can see what that is. See, he lived it out so you can see what living under the Lord is. Which it is hard to define otherwise. Yes. You would recognize, the word I was looking for is recognize. You recognize the way, yes. We call these children to do too, so uh -huh. that as people look at us, they see God in us. That's mm -hmm. right. And that is mm -hmm. how we we learn not just learn from each other, but that's how the spirit, the power of the spirit is uh, is ministered to us mutually. Amen. Mm -hmm. ah, amen. Yes, Brother Justin. I like the I like how you uh, how you said that Jesus. Jesus he overcame everything as a man. Uh, I, I kind of understand where the where the teaching comes that he did it as God comes from because Jesus is extraordinary. He's, mm -hmm. he's everything that he does is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But it reminded me of this. It reminded me that it says, "For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with That's the right. feeling of our infirmity, mm -hmm. but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin." And then it drew my my attention to. Uh, James 1.13 says, uh, says that God can't be tempted with evil. Mm -hmm. So he had to be a man. Well, he couldn't do yeah. it as man God. It wouldn't yeah. count for us if he hadn't. That's right. Uh -huh. I, I really appreciate And if he did it as God, God can't die. So he, he couldn't yeah. have done it as God because God can't die. Uh -huh. I, I just appreciated that being clarified. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, I saw it clear. Uh-huh. Now there there is an insistence in some people well, he he couldn't sin. I remember something that uh, Brother Dean Walker, a quite an aged saint, we were having some conversation over the phone. While he was dying, he talked to me every day. We'd and he said, and Brother Blakely he said there is a sense in which Jesus becoming a man was a risk. Yeah. That's all he said, just yeah. those words there. Mm -hmm. But I, I can see what he's talking about. Because mm -hmm. Jesus had to overcome. That's right. See? Yes. 
He had to overcome. Mm -hmm. He didn't lose by just speaking. Right. And he was tempted. That's right. Yeah. Good things. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this record of our Lord Jesus. Thank You that You inspired it to be written so we can see some of His footsteps and learn from them. Mm -hmm. We commit ourselves to follow Jesus. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.